Hello AP Calculus BC students, Mr. Record here, taking a look at video number five over topic 8.13. Now, what we're gonna do in this series of uh, the next couple of videos is talk about a, a, a subject that is not going to be tested on the BC Calculus exam. So if you're here to kind of prepare for the exam, probably don't need to watch the rest of this video. However, if you're in my class and you're wanting to get some information about the tail end of this optional topic, because it probably will be tested just a little bit, you might want to pay close attention. It's just another way that you can use the integration process to accomplish some kind of a geometric result. So let's take a look at what this is all about, surface area. So back in the AB part of Unit 8, if you recall, you may recall finding volumes of solids of revolution. We're now going to focus on a little bit of a different geometric aspect. So what is the definition of a surface of revolution? Well, it's just if you have the graph of a continuous function, you revolve it about some kind of a line, the surface that you have, that resulting surface, is what we call a surface of revolution. And you can actually find how much space is on the outside. So think about those three-dimensional shapes that you developed before. Instead of finding the volume inside, you're finding how much area there is around it. That's pretty much it. Now, I won't read all of the details here of the notes. You can probably pause the video and do that. But to kind of give you an idea about how this particular formula is developed, I want you to return back to geometry when you were talking about cones. And if I was to take a cone and like chop it off so that the pointy piece disappeared forever, I have this shape that you see here on the screen. And this shape has a very funny name. It's called a frustum right here. It's the frustum of a right circular cone. And we have a really handy dandy formula that will compute the outside surface area or lateral surface area of a frustum. And it goes S equals 2 pi R times L. And if you think about this a little bit, it starts to make sense because the 2 pi r ought to be somewhat familiar to you. The 2 pi r is just really the circumference of a circle that I could have, say, way here at the right side of that frustum. But then if I say, oh, how about we put another circle right next to that one to the left that would have probably a slightly smaller radius, and then another one just to the left of it, which is yet a smaller radius still, and so on and so on and so on, what ends up happening is that we have this long string of circles stacked together that we could actually find the outer surface area for. And to do that, we would just take the circumference measure of any one of those and multiply it by the length. And the length is just an indication of about not how many circles you would have, but how long they would stretch out. Now there is a fundamental issue with that. The radius values aren't always going to be the same, right? As we move from the right of the picture to the left of the picture, the radius values get smaller and smaller. So what we do is we say, well, wait a minute. I bet we could call this radius simply an average of the very smallest radius at the left side and the very largest radius at the right side. And we can get away with that because we have a straight line that serves as our length. So that gives you just a little bit of insight into how we're going to develop this formula. Think 2 pi r times l, and as I move to the next slide, boom, there he is. The definition of the area of a surface of revolution. Let your function y be f of x, continuous derivative on the interval a to b, then the Area S of the surface of revolution formed by revolving this graph of F around the horizontal or even vertical axis is given by 2 pi times a radius. And then this good friend ought to be somewhat familiar because that was what we used to find arc length earlier. So it's your 2 pi RL, basically, in integration form. You can also revolve a, a, a function that's in terms of Y 
And if you do that, everything is pretty much the same. Just keep in mind that you're going to use Y values as your boundaries of integration. So I think that's enough to get us kind of uh, in the door. And we can take a look at our first example dealing with this surface area of revolution number five. So it starts off by asking us to find the area of the surface formed by revolving the graph of f of x equal x cubed on the interval 0 to 1 about the x-axis. And we see it in the right. We see this wonderful picture that's kind of depicting what we're wanting to find. And again, we're not looking for the volume inside the shape, but we're looking for all of this area around the outside. So. I like to approach these surface area revolution problems much the same way I did arc length. Once again, arc length is on the BC exam, the surface area of revolutions are not, but you could certainly encounter them in a college calculus two course. So we're gonna go ahead and take the derivative of F, which is three X squared. That's pretty easy. And then we are going to take that derivative of F and we're going to square him. And that would give us nine X to the fourth. Once you're here, you're pretty much ready to write your formula. And so we start with s equal 2 pi, integral symbol, and then we have to have a radius, which in this case is going to be some r of x. So let's think about what is that radius. Well, that would be the length from the axis of revolution to the curve. And as you can see in the picture, it's going to be cut off here a little bit, but I'll recreate it there our radius is just the function. It's the f of x that we had. And that's going to be very common when you're revolving around the x-axis. So we're gonna take this x cubed, that's our f of x, and we're gonna multiply him by the square root of one plus nine x to the fourth, our f prime squared from earlier. Integrate with respect to x, our boundaries of integration are going to be x values, double check, 0 to 1, that looks good to me, and boom, there's your setup for your arc length, or for your surface area of revolution. So we're going to go ahead and let u substitution do the work for us. Now how do we know that this is a good u sub problem? Well, it's probably likely that you notice that the power inside the radical of four is one larger than what's outside. So there's a good chance that this U substitution is gonna work for us. And I believe it's gonna work wonderfully because our derivative of U is 36 X cubed with our DX. So we're gonna offset with this one over 36 here. So that two pi that's out in front is gonna be joined by a one over 36. We are now integrating just the square root of U with respect to you. Now, I'm a guy that kind of likes to change the boundaries. I don't want to go back to X. Once I've been U mode, I want to stay in U mode. So this upper boundary of one can be changed by plugging it into the U equation for the X, and that would end up giving us 10 as an upper boundary. If we do the same thing with the lower boundary of zero, we find that we get one for the lower boundary. So our 1 is going to turn to a 10, and our 0 is going to turn to a 1. At this point, I'm going to reduce my 2 pi over 36, which is pi over 18. I'm going to go about and integrate u to the half, which is u to the 3 halves, multiplied by 2 thirds. And then all of this expression is going to be evaluated from 10 down to 1. And I could see a little bit more reducing pi over 18 times 2 thirds. If I reduce the 2 and the 18 just a wee bit, I can have pi over 27 out in front. And then my u to the 3 halves is going to allow 10 to be entered. 10 to the 3 halves is what I've got, minus, and then I throw in 1, and 1 to the 3 halves is 1. And we are going to call it a day. Well, we're going to call it a video at least. We're going to finish right there. If you've watched one of the earlier videos, we saw an answer that was very similar to this. It had a 10 to the 3 halves in it. And basically, if you have a non-perfect square here raised to the 3 halves, which is kind of often with these problems, because when you integrate a square root of u, which happens a lot because of the nature of the formula, you'll have a 3 halves exponent. 
and they just don't simplify very well unless you've got a square root that's that's going to be a perfect so we're okay to leave it just like that so there it is there is your first surface area of revolution problem hopefully it makes sense i've got one more video to cover over this topic and it's going to take care of example six so definitely tune into it and i can help you a little bit about how would you deal with the same situation except if you revolved around the y-axis so check it out if you uh, care to hopefully we'll see you next time thanks for watching